All right, hey everybody who's joined. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us here today. Um, we're gonna wait uh, wait a couple more minutes here for everybody to trickle in, and then we'll we'll get rolling. Yeah, so if you uh, feel compelled to do so, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat, uh, just who you are, where you're from, um, personal trivia if you want. Uh, yeah, we're going to kick things off here. Maybe we'll, we'll give it a minute for folks to get in. Hopefully we are um, a lot of people's lunchtime entertainment, so we hope we... We nourish your brains and your souls just as well as your lunch as your belly. I never stared at this photo in this detail. I can see people with buckets in the back. Yeah. Pick those nice orange buckets so they stick out in the landscape. It's critical. That's pro tip number one. Make sure your buckets stick out for sure. Yeah, and that's, here is our colleague Jim Kaufman. Um, also a uh, forest projects coordinator. Um, and uh, the date, uh, the picture is kind of dated because you can kind of see a little bit, Jim's wearing a mask. So this is when we we're still wearing cloth masks and outside. Um, so I don't, I guess probably early 2021 would be the best for this picture. Um, all right, maybe we'll give it a minute more. For folks to join and then yeah i'll kind of kick things off rob and you can um admit folks from from there it's cool let's see all right so far we've got three pennsylvanians in the chat so welcome i don't know if we have folks from other other states but you're being uh represented heavily by PA so far. All right, let's go for it. I'm going to do this last bit, admitting folks. Um, so I'm going to also turn my camera off <clears throat> um, for bandwidth uh, reservation. Um, but yeah, welcome, everybody. Uh, our little live staking 101. Um, if you're in the wrong place, I don't know how you got here, but I hope you enjoy. Um, so uh, my name is Ryan Davis. I'm going to do the first half of the presentation here, uh, talking about kind of how live staking works exactly, the sort of biology behind it, species selection, that kind of stuff. And then Rob Frank, uh, my colleague, Forest Projects Coordinator, is going to take over the um, uh, the practical how-to, uh, how to actually make this work uh, for your projects. Um, so uh, before we jump in, uh, who is the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay? What do we do? Um, we are one of the many Chesapeake-oriented uh, organizations out there. We've been around since 1971. Um, Rob and I are out of our Lancaster, Pennsylvania office. Um, whether we are working out of the Lancaster office or uh, all over, we really focus on restoring the watershed itself. Um, uh, you know, the great thing about watershed restoration is if we restore our local lands, uh, in rivers way up here in Pennsylvania or in central Maryland or, you know, wherever we're working, um, that will ultimately benefit the uh, estuary, the Chesapeake Bay itself, um, but it's going to benefit the that watershed too and the communities who live here. So it's a great way uh, to do things. Um, we have four major teams of work, uh, stewardship and engagement, which, which is all about connecting people uh, to the environment, green infrastructure, which is more sort of urban stormwater practices, um, to, uh, to help reduce the, the negative impacts of our uh, cities on our water quality. Um, agriculture, where we're working uh, primarily with one-on-one uh, -on -one with farmers uh, to help them improve their practices to, to reduce the pollution getting to their streams, and then forests, uh, where Rob and I work. And so um, our job is pretty easy. 
uh, I like to say, because the more forest cover you have in a watershed, the cleaner the water will be. So all we have to do is create more forests and have healthier forests, and then our job is kind of done. Um, uh, but really, our, our kind of mission is to increase the quantity and the quality of forest cover in the Bay watershed. Um, and then very critically, to increase the stewardship amongst the residents uh, for that forest cover. Uh, there are 18 million residents of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and so we have to make sure we're, our message is really getting out there and people are really all on the same page um, because 18 million people is a lot of people to coordinate. And if everyone is kind of just doing their own thing, not all of those things are going to be uh, as um, a positive for the environment as they potentially could be. So very important to reach people um, wherever they're at and, and uh, try to educate them on, on what to do best for their land and their watershed. Um, ah, yes, <laughs> before we forget, I would have forgotten to do this. Um, if you're interested in following along with our work, which you, you may already be on one of these, that this may be how you found out about this webinar, um, but we have a couple different newsletters that I would recommend signing up for. Um, the Confluence is the Alliance's uh, Alliance-wide newsletter, very focused on uh, the watershed, things happening around the watershed. Um, also, uh, all of our events, it's a good place to hear about our tree plantings, our uh, workshops, our events um, all over the watershed, uh, including the Tree Lay, which is a exciting 24-hour volunteer uh, tree planting relay is the full name uh, for that. That's coming up this April. So if you want to get in on the action, uh, that's a great place for you to, to sign up. And then additionally, if you go to the Alliance's website, allianceforthebay.org, uh, find our newsletter page, um, scroll to the bottom, <laughs> uh, you'll find the Forest for the Bay newsletter, um, which is uh, really just focused on uh, information, uh, just educational content about our forest ecosystems. Uh, so every month we put out original articles, videos, um, uh, we have trivia in there, you can win uh, gear uh, in the trivia section, um, so recommend checking those out. I, we have not put out our February newsletter yet, so if you sign up today, uh, you probably are, will not be too late to, to get in on the action. And then I think this is my final front matter thing. Um, on the note of those videos, uh, Jim, who was on the title slide, and I both have little um, shows, I guess, little series that we do um, on YouTube for just educating folks on our natural resources here. Uh, mine's focused on dendrology, tree identification, natural history, uh, and Jim is, uh, Jim's is on wildlife habitat. Um, so go check that out if you're not sick of me uh, by the end of this or already potentially. Um, but don't worry, Rob will take half of this presentation. So you don't have to live with me the whole time. Um, let's jump into it, into the, the meat of the matter here. Uh, live staking, what are we talking about here? Um, basically, it's just propagation by cutting, but then infield um, installation. A lot of folks are familiar with propagation by cutting. Uh, maybe somebody gives you a... Um, uh, a, um, a house plant, you know, that has roots sprouted out from it. You just you just cut a little piece of those uh, plants, put them in water, and they start to root, and then you can plant them. Right? This is basically that, but we're skipping that middleman um, of the of the the vase of water and just putting them right into the ground. Um, this doesn't work for all species. We'll get into specific species, um, but what we're going to be focusing on today is woody species. Um, and cutting that stem tissue, the hard uh, stem tissue uh, during the dormant season is what we highly recommend doing. And we'll get into some you know, specifics there too. Um, I like this picture here on the left. This is my past vehicle before I uh, uh, got a truck. Um, you can fill a hatchback coop uh, with live stakes. You do not have to have a lot of gear. All you need is one pair of pruners, a bucket, um, and the time to get out there and do it. So this is a very affordable way to spread native uh, biomass um, around your area. Um, I'm gonna use a couple graphics from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Big props to them. They have some excellent resources online. Recommend checking those out there, but Rob's gonna get into uh, the specifics for this, but this is kind of what we're looking at. You cut a stake um, of certain you know, um, uh, parameters, which we'll, we'll get into, um, and then you install it, try to get as much of that into the soil as possible, get good connection with groundwater, and then uh, most of these, a majority of these, will uh, develop into mature um, uh, individuals eventually. Um, now, live staking is kind of just the tip of the iceberg. You can use this same technique and the same uh, sort of hacking of biology that we're doing here to accomplish this uh, with other techniques for different things. So a brush mat is something where you need to uh, get that entire face of maybe a recently um, uh, eroded or exposed bank. Uh, and you want to really get that um, armored quickly uh, where you're, you're putting these kind of laterally along the bank and then this... Um, 
this hedge layering where you're burying things so that you're kind of creating sort of terraces uh, with different layers of these species. Um, and then there's uh, finally uh, fascines, which are more kind of horizontal instead of, you know, one live stake going in. This is um, kind of spreading a mat of them, maybe right at the toe of a slope uh, or, or in a bench on a slope. Um, so all sorts of things that you can do, and they all work basically the same way, uh, which we'll get into in just a second. Um, notably, a really great part about live staking is that there's all sorts of leftovers that you can you can do uh, various things with. Um, Rob will get into the details, but you don't want to use the the freshest, newest stems typically uh, for live staking. They just don't work as well. Um, we're talking about the slightly older stems right you know behind them. Um, so you're going to have all these tips left over, um, and there's all sorts of great things you can do with these. Um, from just using for your personal you know goods to actually potentially making some income off of or you can use this as a way to um, uh, get people interested who you may be working with on projects perhaps you're working with private landowners um, these species are great for uh, marketing for for the woody floral market uh, you can see there on the left um, my wife is very crafty and she always uh, makes reeds out of the excess live state clippings that i leave behind in our backyard every spring. Uh, so that is sandbar willow, uh, Salix exigua there, those cute little pussy willow flowers. Um, and uh, we still have it hanging up, uh, one that she made many years ago, um, still on our front door for years. So they're they're nice and tough. Uh, and then I bring in a, a vase, several vases of red osier dogwood cuttings every year um, and uh, put some water in there so they can stay stay alive for a while. And a lot of them will root out and, and we can plant some of them actually um, by the, uh, the end of the spring. Um, so uh, why does this work? What, what's going on here? What is, uh, what is the biology here? And I, I think it is important um, to explain this part because that'll help you in the practicality of where to establish, where to install these stakes that you might be uh, trying to incorporate into your project and also exactly how you're cutting them. If you know how it works, you can do a better job doing those things. Um, so these species that do this really well are wetland species. They are adapted to very disturbance prone environments right next to creeks uh, and in wetland areas. Those disturbance include flooding for sure, ice scour, um, but probably uh, uh, primarily or you know a very big factor is beaver damage actually. So you can see there on the left we had a riparian forest buffer site planted in a park. Oh boy, fall 2018, this site was planted. The trees are doing great. Um, and the uh, municipality emailed me and said, hey, Ryan, things are going great, but a beaver has moved in and has started to take trees down. Um, so I went out there and this is what we found. Um, uh, but these species are adapted to be able to handle this. They can put out uh, new roots, um, <clears throat> or new shoots rather, uh, from that existing root system and they can respond. You know, Think about being a plant. Um, if a predator is coming at us as a human, uh, or any animal, we run away, right? We have that defense mechanism of being able to move. Plants can't move. So their defense mechanism is to be able to take that beating um, and um, and rebound from it. Um, there on the right is a species that does the live staking very well, responds to live staking, um, elderberry, Sambucus canadensis. Um, you can see here, so this was a site that got flooded. Um, just a couple weeks later, I was out there doing maintenance, fixing it up, and this shrub had been pushed over was kind of pinned on the ground and it, within a couple of weeks it had started to put out new roots. Um, the technical term for this is adventitious roots, uh, meaning roots that are growing out of a non-root um, tissue. So these are growing out of a stem uh, that was just touching the ground. Uh, elderberry is so full of these growth hormones and so sensitive to flooding and other you know damage that they, they will do this um, very, very quickly. And you may have seen that in your garden with um, with tomatoes. They'll do that, you know, when they kind of turn into sort of, um, you know, vine mode, <laughs> sprawling vine mode, or maybe it's just me because I don't maintain my garden very well, uh, but they'll start to put in those adventitious roots. Um, ah, but yes, maybe another uh, way to say this is that they they take a licking and they keep on taking. Now, on that note, so this uh, beaver site here, I wanted to show it rebounded well. Um, you can look at all the new shoots pushing out of that um, black willow stump the beaver left behind. So um, I had no uh, qualms, issues with the beavers taking a few uh, stems. Um, it, very interesting. They mostly took things that respond very well to live staking. Um, none of the trees that they took don't really stump sprout. Every single thing that they took uh, stump sprouts very readily, and that's what happened. They rebounded um, 
very quickly. So now what we're going to have here is this black willow, instead of being more tree-like, is going to be more kind of shrub-like. It's going to send up um, a bunch of uh, stems closer to the ground out of these shoots here. Um, and, you know, maybe beavers will be less interested in taking those branches and, and will go to something else uh, and take a stem. So this is why uh, these plants have this adaptation. But what exactly is going on? And this is the part here where you know, understanding how this actually works is going to help you to, to do your harvesting properly so that you can get good results from it. Um, so another kind of weird difference between plants and animals is that um, plants have all sorts of stem cell tissues. They are just loaded with stem cell, cell, cell tissues um, because they are uh, constantly growing. Um, a lot of uh, plants have, you know, they will grow for a very, very long time rather than animals, which will kind of develop and then you know, hold tight and just re replenish their cells, right? And so um, those areas of stem cell growth, we call meristem tissue or meristematic tissue. Um, and so what we can do is we can manipulate these areas of, um, of stem cell tissue where we have um, high concentrations of growth hormones. These gross growth hormones are called auxins. Um, when we move the concentration of those auxins around, we're going to move where those stem cells will respond to that chemical more. So if we behead our stems, if we cut off apical meristems, and let me go back for a second, apical meristems, that yellow arrow there, that is where a majority of our growth hormones are concentrated because a lot of things are growing out, you know, the, the shoots, right? They're growing um, uh, the, out of the tips of their twigs. Um, and so if we remove that, what we're doing is we're, we're shifting that concentration of growth, growth hormones to the lateral um, stem cell tissues to those intercalary meristems where new uh, roots and then new shoots can grow out of. Um, additionally, uh, from, from cutting those meristems off, uh, those buds off, and then also from burying them in the soil, changing their environmental conditions, that's going to help stimulate that growth. But even leaving them in a bucket of water, a lot of times you'll start to see the roots uh, grow out. Um, and so again, all this to say, it is very important that you uh, listen very closely to Rob <laughs> so that you get good results from your live stake. Um, so uh, my last kind of thing here that I'm going to discuss is species before we pass it off to Rob. Um, there's a bunch, you know, we do this every year um, and it, it works really well for us. So I wanted to share our kind of personal um, observations for what species do really well. Uh, box elder, which is in the maple family, Acer nagundo, and black willow, Salix nigra, are very good for tree species at, at responding well to live stake um, uh, propagation. Um, and I put little asterisks here by uh, species that we do have tree talks on, if you are interested. I did not think to update them, <laughs> but I don't think there's any um, uh, here that, um, uh, that we have a tree talk on that I haven't asterisked yet. Um, species that I see a lot cited uh, to do to respond well to live staking that we have not tried um, are American sycamore, river birch, and eastern cottonwood. So those are three that that folks can really try out. And why it's important to consider having trees in the mix here, um, like if you have an exposed bank and you're, and you're trying to revegetate it, it is awesome to have that huge thicket of shrubs, but having some diversity in there, having some tree species sticking up out of it is a really valuable thing. Um, so there's our black willow, and that's probably, uh, going back to our beaver example, probably what that black willow is going to look like someday. It's going to have this huge spreading form um, where every one of those big stems is, is uh, trying to soak up as much sunshine as possible uh, for more energy. Uh, there on the right, uh, box elder. This is actually, I think, a screenshot from uh, the tree talk on it. I apologize for the dirty fingers <laughs> it's during planting season. Um, but these are the stems that you're going to be cutting. They have a very distinctive green color, um, and the, uh, the the leaves touch, and the leaf scars touch uh, across the stem like that. They wrap around the stem, so that's very distinctive. Um, on the shrub side, shrubs seem to do better in our experience than the tree species um, at responding to live staking. Um, so I kind of categorize them in a couple different um, uh, buckets here, uh, no pun intended. Um, the dogwood species do very well. They are kind of champions at this, some of the best that we have. Um, red osier dogwood and silky dogwood. Also um, shrub willows. So we have sandbar willow. Uh, and depending on where in the country you are, you might call it a coyote willow. Uh, pussy willow. Elderberry, again, does very, very well. Swamp rose. Um, things that we have had pretty good success with, but maybe not as good 
Um, alder species do well, smooth and serrated alder, airwood viburnum, buttonbush, and winterberry. Uh, they'll all do pretty good, but just not as good as those, those shrub dogwoods. Um, and then some other species that we see a lot cited, but we have not tried personally yet, are ninebark, spicebush, and uh, highbush blueberry. Um, so uh, quick uh, pictures of what these things look like. There's red osier dogwood. Uh, red osier dogwood I describe as having a kind of lobster red bark, whereas the silky dogwood has more of a kind of purple red bark. Um, uh, red osier dogwood is the most abundant dogwood species in on the continent in North America. Um, very common in wet areas. Uh, and then elderberry also super common there on the right. This is obviously during the summer and this is what those berries look like. They have huge white um, flower clusters that develop into these berries. Uh, and the, the pollinators love the flowers and the birds love the berries. So you'll have to beat them to both. Um, elderberry twigs, the stems are very um, easy to identify. Those lenticels, that's um, gas exchange pores uh, in the bark are very wordy, very distinctive. Um, also elderberry and red osier dogwood, all the dogwoods are opposite. So they have opposite branching pattern, meaning those, those branches are coming out the twig opposite of each other rather than alternating up and down the stem. Um, a lot of time the roots will develop out of those lenticels. It's pretty interesting on that um, elderberry. Uh, there in the left swamp rose, we have actually a bunch of native rose species, uh, multiflora rose, which is Invasive, introduced and invasive is our probably our most abundant rose, but we have a lot of native roses um, and swamp rose responds very well to live staking. Actually, both of these pictures are in my yard. I took some live stakes from uh, a site, you know, when we were harvesting and tried to pot them up and a bunch of them survived and I planted them in my yard. And now, now they're a wonderful little component of my backyard. And there on the right is my little hedge of coyote willow. Um, uh, and so that's where we get all those wreaths from and a ton of live stake mass every single year. It's also a great little sort of privacy fence, especially, you know, imagine during the growing season when it's all those leaves. Um, and then uh, button bush here on the left, great hummingbird plant, uh, great pollinator plant, and it does respond quite well to live staking. Um, and then arrowwood here on the right, uh, excellent uh, wildlife mast species, in addition to doing pretty well with, with live staking. Uh, I think this is my final species. Uh, winterberry, Ilex decidua. If you are botanically inclined, you may um, note that Ilex is the genus of hollies. So this is a holly species uh, that is deciduous, unlike American holly. Um, and it'll produce these really beautiful red berries that persist through the winter. So excellent bird food, wildlife food, uh, but also really pretty. And um, a lot of people sell these and a lot of people buy them uh, for winter decor, um, including myself. I will buy them when I see them. Um, so uh, ah, I think this is my final slide. Um, these are just our observations. I would recommend looking into some data. Um, our partners at Chesapeake Conservancy uh, did some work in central Pennsylvania over a couple years gathering a lot of data um, in partnership with Susquehanna University, and they just put a study out uh, at the end of last year. So highly recommend checking that out. They have not only species recommendations, but also some data on different treatments that you could uh, apply to your live stakes to potentially enhance enhance um, your results. Okay, now I think, yes, it's over to Rob. So I am going to stop my share and let him pick up from here. All right. Thank you, Ryan. And there we go. We're sharing. Well, I appreciate the introduction there. Um, going over a little bit about it, but uh, we're going to go into the practical applications of using live stake. Um, right there on the screen, you can see how many roots that little twig is putting out uh, compared to the amount of uh, leaf material it has uh, above ground. So uh, a, big, a big component of this is just maximizing the amount of vegetation that you can get into a stream bank area. Uh, in addition to that being good for habitat and ecosystem uh, concerns, we are also looking at the stream bank stabilization. So if you have a stream bank that is eroding, a lot of times uh, it's just not stable. You have a bad uh, mix of soil in there, could be a lot of sediment, uh, stuff that's gonna wash away, stuff that's gonna go into the rivers, um, find its way down to the bay and increase those dead zones with all the nutrients that are going along with the sediment pollution. Uh, so we would like to have the root systems in there and those additional uh, 
twig structures there to take a bite out of the floodwaters uh, to hold that soil in place. They're going to want to hold the soil in. That's what they're growing in. So uh, self-preservation. And we're happy to assist them in that in that regard. Um, and beyond that, we are using this to enhance riparian buffers. If you aren't familiar with the concept of riparian buffer, it's just basically trees that you plant by a stream. You've probably seen that. You've probably seen the tree tubes about. Um, they uh, have their limitations in where they can be planted. So if you are putting it into a flood prone zone, uh, heck, we saw this. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, a riparian buffer that we put in got hit by a flood. The tubes, the stakes, uh, they ended up getting caught in the floodwaters. We had a, a long work day, couldn't complete it. So we're going to have to go back out there. And I think uh, among the four people that were there, we all said, we really should live stake this one. Um, and looking at the site, the species that were there, probably adapted to that flood prone area. We saw red osier dogwood. We saw uh, lots of sycamores, a lot of birch, because birch like the water areas too, um, and tons and tons and tons of black willow. So um, going into that area, this area was a uh, recently restored stream. Um, get into that in a little bit, but that's that disturbed area where there's the loose soils, where you're gonna have good stem to soil contact uh, and it's going to have those uh, adventive roots growing out there, stabilizing the soil, getting new plants established. So that's exactly where we want to put it. Um, so what else? We have a demonstration of this. Uh, this is a stream restoration. If you look on that 2016 picture, you can see at the bottom there is a mud sill. Uh, mud sill is just a way of armoring the stream bank. You can see that strong curve in the stream bank. Upstream of this picture, there is a uh, bridge. Uh, bridges aren't known for being flexible in how they let water through. So they tend to just shoot it in one direction. And uh, what was in front of it on the downstream side was just a large uh, embankment uh, history of the site was that it was a, the site of a former mill dam, uh, not cutting logs by water power anymore. They took out the dam and, well, there you go. You got this big embankment washing away. The top of the hill, you can see that there's pines. There were further pines uh, and they were falling into the stream. Put in that restoration, uh, backfilled it, put in the seeds for the grass and some of those rocks to armor it. And then we put in the live stakes. This was willow species, uh, three varieties there, and then the dogwood species that were previously mentioned. And, uh, you know, four years later, it's all covered. You can't even see that embankment. And, and for, if I didn't mention, that's about a 15 foot embankment. So uh, a lot of armoring there. That's really going to help uh, hold that in. It's going to increase the strength of that um, and reduce the flood effects that are going to be on that uh, embankment. You imagine the water flowing toward that. It can get pretty high. Um, this is going to slow that down, you know, uh, same way that uh, your water, your, uh, your lawn, for what it's worth, is going to slow down water better than the gutter that's just washing it away. Um, another, well, you know, while we're looking at this one, um, we did take the macroinvertebrate sample there. That's the bugs, the things that eat everything that uh, goes into the stream. Uh, by adding the live stakes there, we're also increasing the biodiversity of the stream side uh, plants. And well, they're gonna shed their leaves and that's all gonna fall into the water. And that's gonna feed lots of different types of organisms in there. Um, it all starts with you know your bacteria and your bugs and your fungus and all that. So that's what the fish eat. So if you're feeding what the fish eat, then you're going to have more fish. So if you get mad at snagging your line in this uh, nice tangle on the side and, you know, all the birds are happy to hide in there and eat all the berries. Well, that's what's making the fish happy, too. So uh, you don't have the, the uh, streamside uh, plants. It's also shading it and providing cover, cooling the water. You're not going to have the fish. So. Another 
great habitat feature of live stakes for any of you trout folks out there, trout unlimited folks. Keep that one in mind. Here's a little bit of the um, the, the practical uh, uses of it. Uh, we're cutting these at about 18 inches long. Um, now I put that, I added a little thing here. That'll stick out of the bucket. We're using those big hardware store buckets, uh, hardware store of choice, but we like the big orange ones just because they're visible, but they come in red and blue too. Um, but yeah, put those in there. They should stick out of the top by about four inches or so. Um, and the width of it is from a dime to about two pennies. So a half inch to one and a half inches wide. Uh, why is that the size we're going for? Uh, there is an amount of resource uh, stored inside the stake that it will need to grow. So if you put one in that's too small, well, it's just going to run out of gas before it can get itself established. So uh, want to have the energy resources in the stake to get it in there. Additionally, you want to be able to have that go down into the soil. Uh, that is just practical. Keep it, keep it in place. Uh, additionally, you have all those nodes you can see on that picture on the left, uh, excuse me, on the right. And uh, that's where your roots are going to grow out of. So you want to have as many in the ground to grow out as possible. And another, uh, you know, I was... As I'm doing the field work, uh, a way that I can keep track of this is a live stake for me is about the length of my forearm to my fingertips. And uh, the maximum width is about two thumbs and the minimum width is about a penny for me, or uh, excuse me, I don't have a penny on my body, a pinky. Um, so if you get into it, try to think about that sort of things. You'll start to measure things with your body too. Uh, it's fun, probably keeps you young. Um, the next thing is important, the diagonal cut on the part closest to the roots. So why do I say closest to the roots? Because maybe you're trimming an elderberry and those branches are curving over and going back down toward the ground. You want to trace that back to the roots. Uh, they want to grow roots at the bottom. Uh, that's where they want to do it. The diagonal cut is twofold. Cut it diagonally. That way you know which part is down. Uh, and secondly, when you're pushing into the ground, that angle will help you drive it in there because you're going to be using a, a mallet. Um, so you have that flat surface at the top for pounding it in there or, you know, maybe you can just push it in there. But, you know, we use a mallet most of the time. And then that pointed end will just help you to drive it into the ground. Uh, the second thing you're going to want to do is keep those live stakes moist. Uh, they do dry out. Um, they will, uh, you know, they're, they're want, wanting to be adapted to being in the wet environment, wetland species, uh, disturbed species. So they're used to being next to the water or if they get cut off, float downstream and find a nice wet stream bank to be in. So we want to keep them happy. So we keep them in our, our bucket, wet bucket. Uh, there's other ways to do that. Um, there is an example. You see all those ones sticking out of the top. We have different widths on those, but uh, you know they're generally uh, about that pinky to uh, two thumbs, two pennies wide. Um, there's water in the bottom of those buckets. If you are transporting them and you're in, you have a uh, a vehicle where you're not really so keen on spilling a bunch of water in the back seat. Um, Wet newspapers can work. Uh, getting them in a plastic bag, rack, wrapping them in some wet newspaper, wet paper. Um, other examples I've heard used are to use rice hulls. Uh, most people don't have access to write rice hulls, but it is an option should you find yourself up to your elbows in rice hulls. Well, now you have a use for it. It's keeping your live stakes wet. Um, and, you know, here's another one. Ryan hinted to it earlier. Uh, you can get the live stakes and you can put them in a in soil, pot them up, and they will start to grow a, a shrub. I've done this in my own yard with elderberry and button bush. It works great. So that's just another way to transport them if you're transporting them to your house to start your own little live stake nursery. When you are putting these into the ground, you're trying to get two thirds to a 
uh, three quarters in. You can go a little bit further, but you want to have a couple of those nodes out of the ground so that they can put up some uh, some branches to get some solar energy, to get some leaves growing. Uh, the bulk of that's going to be want to be in the ground. Um, you know, another reason for that is you're going to have your wildlife coming around browsing on it. Deer can pull these out of the ground. Uh, it has happened, but, you know, the more that it's in the ground, the more likely it is to be rooted, the less chance they're going to have of just yanking that out. Um, and you want to have the maximum amount of roots down the ground. The angle that you're going to want to use is 90 degrees to the soil surface. Again, that keeps it uh, maximally in the ground and at the angle that most plants grow. They grow perpendicular to the soil, so we're going to have them down in there, how they're happy. I put the little thing about the point down. Uh, I've absolutely driven a live stake in backwards. Uh, you know, everyone remembers their first time. It's funny. Um, but uh, yeah, the point goes down. It's just going to make it a lot easier to drive in. If you put one in upside down, uh, it's not the end of the world, but uh, they do prefer to be in uh, with that point down, the point towards the root system. And you see that picture there. That's just a, a good guide for it. Here we see a couple of examples. Uh, again, it's that first slide. You know, we should probably do, uh, you know, find the differences on this one from the initial slide to this one. But uh, Jim's putting that in, got that good 90 degree angle going right down into the ground. Um, and on the right side, you see there's a happy dogwood that's probably a silky, I think, uh, growing in. That's right outside our office in Lancaster. We love to just put our live stakes in there and see what comes up. And right now we have, oh, geez, we have a number of dogwoods. We have some willows, buttonbush, and alders all popping up in there, uh, just helping to reinforce that. You can see there's a little bit of... Uh, of uh, sediment there. It is a stream that floods. It is a site that used to have a mill. So uh, again, helping to reinforce that uh, stream bank, increase this stream bank stabilization and uh, the biodiversity of the site. We want to invite you, if you'd like to know more, if you'd like to see the practical application of this to uh, the Horn Farm in York, uh, we'll be doing some harvesting there, and uh, you can learn all about that uh, process and ask your questions and, you know, help gather up some live stakes that we'll be putting into uh, some stream streams in the area. Um, let me go back to that one. So, yeah, the website's there. Um, go to that website. That'll give you a little bit of information about that. Uh, additionally, um, while you're there, go take a look at some of the other events we have, we've got coming up, have our uh, Wild and Scenic F Film Festival, and that'll also be the location where we can have uh, the links to our tree plantings that are coming up, including uh, the tree lay, which will be um, that first weekend in, uh, well, uh, in, in April, yeah. Um, so look forward for that. We'd love to have you out. Um, these are some other resources that we'd like to refer to uh, you to if you want to get a second opinion. Uh, we learned a lot from them. Uh, we are in cooperation with them uh, on these uh, projects. Uh, all big believers in the live stake application and uh, different processes uh, of getting that in place, going out and harvesting, uh, distributing storing, getting them out to people that need them, having events where they're installed at places that need them. And uh, another practice, which is really great, which I'm really, really excited about, they're starting live stake nurseries. These are just places where they are getting these host plants, the, the plants that you would get the live stakes from planted and uh, grown so that it's just a reliable source to go out and harvest uh, yearly. Uh, go out and get those and put them in the ground. 
Um, you know what? I just realized I skipped over a little bit about what time of year we do this. Uh, the time of year for live stake, staking is about now. We start harvesting them now. Uh, March is generally the wheelhouse where you get those in the ground. It's before they leaf out, but when they start um, kind of waking up for the year and uh, getting getting ready for the growing season. So, yeah, late February, March is when we do the bulk of our, our live staking uh, efforts. You can do it a little bit further, but you really have to keep them uh, wet after that. And if we didn't mention it, please do sign up for our newsletters. This keeps you involved uh, with what we're doing. Uh, you'll get invitations to these educational events and also our field work, volunteer events, uh, different things that, that's going on. Uh, oh, right there, we got a picture of the tree leg, planting trees in the dark. So if you'd like to do that, please do that. Um, it's it's really fun uh and you know we need all the help we can get out there and love to have a great turnout for that in april and there we see jim and rebecca loading up the the truck for uh live stakes and with that we turn it over to everybody else all right thanks rob we had a couple questions come in um, so I'll go ahead and address them. So thank you for the uh, person who reminded me to put the link in the chat to that study. I had meant to do that. Um, so you'll find that there. Um, let's see. Look at the other questions. We've got, uh, can any of these species be transplanted to a drier location in the future? I believe Rob addressed that. Um, but yeah, definitely. They do very well um, at, uh, at doing that. Um, and I think someone else asked kind of what soil, I mean, these are tough species that, I mean, I actually have done a stress test. They barely even need soil. Huh? So just some medium for their roots to grow into anything, any kind of junk, you know, um, that you can, uh, you can stick them in for a couple months will do well. Um, I would recommend making sure you're watering them heavily because they are species that, that like wet feet and because they don't have well-defined roots when you're potting them they really need a lot of water so they can they can suck it up and nourish themselves um let's see yes our uh one of our uh, esteemed volunteers rob winslow who has his camera on here was pictured in a bunch of these so thanks rob for uh, being a, 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 our uh, example here today um rob addressed the time of the year dormant season one of the things that was borne out really interesting in that Chesapeake Conservancy and Susquehanna University study, um, they did science on fall or spring. We always like to cut as quickly as we can before we're gonna install them. And we wanna install them during the dormant season, um, but you can cut them in the fall. They found that fall harvested and fall installed do um, perform a lot worse. So if you can wait until spring, Kind of you know end of february early march is sort of the best time to do it um and then i think another question related to that was that time frame between cutting and staking i think the ideal is that day <laughs> as as quickly as you can um just so that you don't have issues of them drying out um uh, but a couple weeks is usually pretty good and like rob said sometimes we'll have them in there a bucket we just kind of won't get around to for a, a whole month um and they you know tend to do okay, but your survival increases the, the faster uh, you, you stick them in the ground. Um, and I'd say, yeah, well, I, I may as well keep running around while I'm muted. Um, uh, Heather Bowie here asks, it's okay if the ground freezes. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, as long as you can get that in there well, you might get some frost heave, right? But that's one of the reasons why we wanna wait until close to the end of the winter and the beginning of the spring so that we, we don't have the ground freezing and pushing them right out of the soil. Um, did I miss anything, Rob, in my quick run of, or do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I don't see any, uh, the questions don't seem to, you, I think you got them all. And, uh, yeah, I mean, these species, you can transplant them so easily. Uh, you know, they, they want to have their growing conditions. Um, but most of them you can even grow in your yard, as long as your yard isn't like, too sun baked. Uh, uh, 
changing climate with warm winter days. Well, yeah, uh, there's still going to be um, a dormant period. They still are going to lose their leaves, but um, I'd still just get them in the ground before they start to leaf out. Really, that's you're going to want. They're using up their, you know, energy and their hormone reserves by that point. So you definitely want to get them in there before leaf out. You can still try it, but uh, um, yeah, uh, I, I pot them up at the end of the season and, and used them um, uh, on my own. Can the steaks survive oxygen starved sediment muck? Um, I do find these growing in those types of places. Um, your wet, wetter areas. Uh, yeah, you got. You have any input on that one? I mean, where we harvest them is, is mucky areas typically. Uh, yeah, and I've I did a stress test on those willows that I, I showed a picture in my yard before I planted them. I potted them and then I flooded a Rubbermaid tub and in the entire growing season, I made sure they were in water. So they were in water for the entire growing season and they survived. I don't think I had any losses and I ended up transplanting them and growing them. So yeah, they can, they can survive with very low oxygen. Some of these species, again, that's part of what, um, what these adaptations, you know, entail. And bush is one of the ones that people talk about a lot in nature. I own, own, almost exclusively see button bush growing in super super wet sites that have very little oxygen um so they they seem to like it yeah and uh if anybody has any other questions feel free to um either pop it in the chat or i think you could probably um unmute and ask it um but if not we finished a little early here so i'll pause for a sec nothing wrong with finishing early makes up for all the time that we talk too much, <laughs> which is frequent for both of us. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, this has been recorded. I think everyone should have gotten that notification and um, our communications team will trim out the part in the beginning where we were getting stuff set up and then post it um, online. So if you want to share it uh, or, or refer to it later, it'll be there for you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Happy spring. Go cut some steaks. And um, thanks for helping revegetate our uh, ecosystems. All right. Oh, one, uh, I, as people are leaving, there is one question I'll address real quick from C. Uh, rooting them in buckets before live staking or cut and stake, we put them in the buckets to keep them wet. And it, it is kind of an accident that sometimes the buckets don't end up getting staked uh, and they'll start to push roots out and and then we can either pot them up or we can try to stake them. But we recommend staking them as close to harvest as you possibly can. And the buckets are just to keep them keep them damp. So sorry for the the confusion there. Hope that helps. Cool. All right. That's our tree go ahead and yeah, yeah, please. We'll see you out there, hopefully, folks. All right. Take care.